Oh well, now that I had to trade my picture with my stylus, let me at least take advantage of it. So our goal is to approximate the stable models of a logic program by a lower bound and an upper bound. So to put this a little bit in, in, a, in a tiny picture, we have our lower bound. This is this guy here. And these are the atoms that are supposedly true. And then we have our upper bound. This is this guy. And these are the atoms that are still regarded as possible. Hence, everything that is beyond the upper bound, here, 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 or whatever outside, this is already uh, dismissed and regarded to be false. That's actually something that you already know from our grounding section, where actually you can be associated with the atom base of all possibly derivable atoms, and uh, L are those atoms in the atom base that have already been found to be true. Okay, and now of course we want to approximate the stable models, and these are the guys that are sitting in between. So they, they all must contain the lower bound, and must themselves be contained in the upper bound. So that would be our x. But of course, there may be several such stable models in between. And the lower and the upper bound uh, give an approximation of all of them. OK, uh, now that we got a bit the principle, and you saw my beautiful picture, ho, 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 where Christmas is coming, um, the, the goal now actually is to work on this lower and upper bound and to extend the lower bound outwards and to decrease the upper bound and to make it on both of them tighter so that we get a better approximation of the stable models. And ultimately, by some further uh, uh, techniques, we actually want to make the lower and the upper bound coincide so that we have a single stable model in between and then we can say, hey, we found a stable model. But that's actually something we'll see later on. The big question is now, how can we actually tighten the, the lower and the upper bound? Uh, and what is the approach to do that? And uh, Again, keep in mind, I, I, I call this section solving from first principles, and the idea that comes with it is actually to exploit the definition of a stable model and to see actually what we can do with this definition here, or with, it, with this equation here and the concepts in, in, inside to get this tightening uh, gone. Well, I guess the very first question that arises how to find a first lower and upper bound. What would be some more values to put for the lower and upper bound? And let's do this next with an example, actually. So here's the example I want to look, look at with you. And actually, it's the same example on the left and the right. It's just that I want to treat it on the left with a lower bound and on the right with the upper bound. So before doing that, the question, of course, is what would be a good lower and upper bound to start with? And here we really get very easy and take, uh, well, I wouldn't say obvious, but extreme choices, right? Uh, one thing that satisfies this equation up here is just to say we have the lower bound is the empty set uh, and the upper bound is the set of all atoms. And of course, all stable models have to be within both of them. So why don't we try these guys um, and then look a little bit what happens to the program if we work with our uh, definition here on the right hand side. So before doing that, let's perhaps have a brief look at the uh, example program to see a little bit what we can expect. Let's do some wishful thinking. So again, our goal is to uh, increase the lower bound and to decrease the upper bound. So that is remove elements from the upper bound and add elements to the lower bound and so to tighten the approximation. So the first thing if we look at the example is that we see that A is a fact and hence A must be true, so I think A is a candidate that we would like to see to be added to the lower bound, right? So if we have a good mechanism to extend the bounds, A should, should become a member of the lower bound. What about the upper bound? So if we look at the heads of the program, or at, at, at the heads of the rules in the program, we see that we have a head for A, B, D, and E, so we just missed a C. Actually, there is no rule that allows us to derive C, hence C can never be true, and hence, uh, it is not possible to derive it and we can actually remove it from the upper bound. So that's another candidate that we would like to see in, a, in, a, in, the, next iter in the next refinement of our, of our bounds. Now, these are the obvious ones, right? So A should be true, C should be false. But then a closer look actually reveals that there is a third candidate because in case we manage to find 
out that A is true and that C is false, then actually B becomes true as well. And so B should also become, at some point, a member of the lower bound. It's not so obvious as A, but it's something actually a good approximation technique should be able to find out as well. Now good, so B being true also means that we that this guy is true, and so with the last two rules, we are left with a so-called even loop, right? So look, D depends on the negation of E, and E depends on the negation of D, and then we're back to square one, and so we have here a so-called even loop that normally induces alternatives to stable models. And this is something we will not be able to, to, to resolve with an approximation. So because this smells very much like two stable models, and actually there are two stable models, which the experienced ASP user may see now. Okay, I zip it, even though you can't see it. <laughs> and um, so, so we, again, to summarize, so a good approximation technique should be able to find out that A is true and C is false. And if it is really good, that B is true as well. But D and E cannot be distinguished because they they uh, induce alternative solutions. Anyway, now that now that you, we got an intuition on, on the example, let's just do the, the reduction. Okay, so on the one hand, on the left hand, I, I want to reduce with the lower bound and on the right hand side with the upper bound and this is A, B, C, D and E. Oh wow. Nice handwriting. <laughs> Sorry for that. Good. And then we reduce the programs with, with these guys accordingly. So I'm just lazy here. This is, of course, the same as, as, as the alpha. And let's see what comes out. So you, you may remember, actually, from, from the exercises and from the introduction section that whenever we reduce um, a program, we only have to look at the occurrences of negation in, in this program, right? On the left-hand side, we have no knowledge about any atoms being true, while on the right-hand side, we have a very strong assumption. We actually assume that all atoms are true. Okay, what happens? So on the left-hand side, uh, ni neither C nor E nor D are in the empty set. Hence, uh, they, they, they are not found, found out to be true. Hence, the negation can be assumed to be false. So we can eliminate this guy and this guy and this guy. And we we... We obtain the pr a program consisting of four rules, two facts, and two uh, positive rules. Okay, on the right-hand side, things are a bit more drastic, right? Since we assume that A, B, C, D, uh, and E are true, the negation of them is false. Hence, this rule goes away because it's vacuous, this rule and this rule. And here we are left with a, with a single fact, a positive program, which says that A is true. Now, the first thing we actually observe on that, and let's just observe this on the example, right? So that given that, of course, the empty set is contained in the set of all, all atoms, it it's the inverse with the reduct. So actually, this implies that the reduct of this with the set of all atoms is smaller than the reduct with the empty set. Hence, here we get something that you may call an anti-monotonic behavior, right? And I think this makes sense because here you reduce uh, with a much larger set. Many more things uh, are assumed to be true. Hence, many more rules will get deleted. Uh, while here on the right-hand side, or on, on this side here, on the left-hand side, depending on how you look at it, uh, everything you have no knowledge about anything being true. Hence, the negative atoms are still... Uh, uh, can be regarded as true, and there a lot of positive rules remain, right? And of course, everything that that is in this set also is in this set or reduct to be to be precise, right? Okay, good. Now, what about the consequences, right? That's the next thing that we are interested in. And if we now let that look at the consequence of each program, what do we find out? First of all, we have our um, let's just stay with the, with the red. We have the consequences of the program reduced with the empty set, and here we get quite a bunch, right? We have A, if we have A, we have B, if we have B, we have D, and E is a fact. So actually we get all the heads of, of the programs, of the program, of the rules, and this is A, B, D, and E. But interestingly, this construction uh, found out, so to speak, right, that C is not derivable, right? Because C is, is not among the possibly derivable uh, atoms, because after all, by assuming that nothing is true, you have, 
you are somehow very, how to say, very optimistic, right? You say, oh, uh, nothing is refuted so far, let's just see what is possible. And then more or less you, ha you get the set of all possibly derivable atoms and these are exactly the heads. So that's cool. So here we actually found out more or less by, by, by assuming that, really being pessimistic, by assuming that nothing, nothing holds, that C is, even in this extreme case, not derivable. Good. Now what happens on the, on, on the, on the right-hand side? So if we look at the consequences of the program reduced with a set of all atoms. So here things go more or less just the other way, right? So here we are, we are um, so, to, so to speak, very, um, how, what did I say before, pessimistic or optimistic? Here we assume that all the guys are true, right? So we are very I think, pessimistic, right? And ha accordingly, all the rules uh, are dismissed and the only thing that remains is here the fact that A is true. Okay, that's what we get. And in a way, in the same way as as uh, as um, as we here obtain that C cannot be true, because in the in the optimistic way, more or less, um, um, we we could not, not not even in the most optimistic case we could derive C. Here, in the most pessimistic case, where we assume that ev assume that everything is true, then we obtain nonetheless one solid foundation. This is always false coming, and this is A. So and this gives us actually more or less the observation that we had at the beginning where I was saying that A should be true and since C is not in the heads, C should be false. And these two guys already reflect this, right? So far they do not actually tell us anything about B, but let, let's, let's wait and see. Oh, this, this even rhymes. Oh. Anyway, the other thing that we, that, we, uh, that we see is that since, keep in mind, the, the consequences, and this is also an operator, of a positive logic program are based on the TP operator. The TP operator is monotone, so when, whenever you actually increase the argument, you get more information. And somehow this also translates to the consequence operator on positive logic programs, even though I would not make a formal argument here. And so what we also observe is that the consequences uh, the consequences of the program reduced with the, with, with the, with the entire set are contained in the consequences of the program reduced with the empty set. So and this extends a little bit the relation that we have up here. So the consequences of, oh, hopefully I have enough space for that, of P reduced with A are contained in the consequences of P reduced with the empty set. Hmm. So. Looking at this example, I think we, we got some first intuitions and the, of course this is perhaps not uh, a most uh, general view on things because we just looked at the example, but I think the intuitions are already there, right? So, and, but now of course the big question is whether these, these results here, right, or these observations here generalize and let me just make this case in the next, uh, in the next little session. Okay, see you then, or hear you then actually because you don't see me, but I don't see you anyway. Okay. <laughs> Stay tuned. Okay, let us discuss a little bit in how far the observations we made on our example generalize to the arbitrary case. So arbitrary case always means we have a variable and of course we call it x without this being a stable model now and then we have another variable that we call y and the set y, x is contained in the set y. And now the observation we made actually that if this is the case then the reduct with a larger set is contained in the reduct with a smaller set. And I guess one way to see that this holds is keep in mind that x is a subset of y. So everything that you removed here, you also removed here, but more because y is larger than x, right? I think this is, this is a, a, a simple intuition, at least that works uh, with me. And then again, as mentioned on the example with the consequence operator, it is monotone. So whenever you have a larger input, you also get a larger output. So this means that the consequences of the smaller program, smaller positive program, are also contained in the consequences of the larger program. So this is more or less the relationship that we observed on the example. And I would, uh, and I think I argued. And, and I don't know whether I convinced you, but I explained actually why this also holds in the general case. Now let's exploit this a little bit, not a little bit, let, let's really exploit this to start from our relation that the stable models are betw between the lower and the upper bound and tighten the lower and the upper bound. 
So what about the lower bound? First of all, we know that the lower bound is contained in uh, in any stable model that we look at. So this means, let's just take another color, that L is contained in the stable model. And now we can just uh, reuse this relationship. We can say if, the, if we have a, a subset relationship, then the consequences behave that way. Let's do that. So this means that the consequences of the program reduced with a larger set, with this, which is x in our case, are a subset of the consequences of the program reduced with a smaller set, which is the lower bound in our case. Okay, so this is more or less just copying the relation or uh, transfer, transferring this relationship to, to our case here where we have the lower and the, the lower bound and x. But here's one bit of information that we have more. We know that x is a stable model and hence x equals actually consequences of px and more importantly vice versa. This expression here equals x. So we can actually remove this guy here with x. Okay, let's do that. So then the, the expression on the right hand side is equivalent to x is a subset of the consequences of the program reduced with a lower set. Hmm, interesting. Okay, let's, before we combine things, let's first of all look at the upper bound. And uh, th there we have, a, of course, a similar uh, situation. Here actually our stable model is contained in the upper bound. Let's just do that. So the x is a subset of the upper bound. And again, we just apply apply uh, this relationship here, right? So we, we then find, well, just state that the consequences of the program reduced with a larger set, which is now the upper bound, is a subset of the consequences of the program reduced with x. And now again, we find here, uh, the, the, the expression in the definition of a stable model and we can replace now the right hand side with x. So then this on the, the right hand side expression is equivalent to the consequences of the program reduced by the upper bound is a subset of x. So interestingly now we, 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 we see a couple of things, right? So we know that the lower bound is contained in x but we also see, for instance, that the consequences of the program reduced with the upper bound is also contained in x. And vice versa, of course, x is contained in the upper bound, but x is also contained in the consequences of the program reduced with the lower bound. And this is now really getting interesting. And now actually I, I, uh, I filled my slide. Let, let's first get me some space and then we will actually use these things to really tighten the approximation of a stable model. So. Stay tuned. Okay, now that I made us some space, let's see what we get for tightening our lower and upper bound. As mentioned before, so, well, of course we know that the lower bound is contained in X, but now we also, uh, no, uh, well, figured out that the consequences of the program reduced by the upper bound, this guy here, is also contained in X. Both of them are. Okay, we can just put this together. The lower bound and the consequences of the program with the upper bound of the program reduced with the upper bound are both contained in x and this actually means that we now added elements to our lower bound and we are strengthening we are making it bigger so how do things look like at the upper bound well as before uh, we have by definition right that x is a subset of u so we have this here but in addition we know now that x is also a subset of the consequences of the program reduced by the lower bound. So now x is in the upper bound and it's in the consequences of the program reduced with the lower bound. So now putting this together means x is a subset of u and uh, of the consequences of the program reduced with the lower bound. right? So keep in mind that even though I was speaking and both times, here it's a, a, a union and here we talk about an intersection because L is a subset of X and this guy is a subset of X. But here it's the other way around. X is a subset of this guy and of this guy, right? So this is actually why, why I talked about and, 
but uh, at the end of the day this here we union we extend our lower bound and here we do the intersection we actually make our upper bound smaller we decrease it and in this way once we start actually with the lower and the upper bound and let's say we start with the empty set here and here with a set of all uh, atoms we then actually can extend the lower bound and increase the upper bound in this way and this is more or less the key idea of this approximation that will now lead to our first algorithm that allows us to propagate to compute the truth values of atoms by using this approximation technique okay and now back to the normal procedure